Hello and welcome to Angel's Costumes Behind the Seams. I'm Jeremy Angel. I'm Richard Green. And I'm Jonathan Littman. And this week, I'm really pleased to present the chat that I had with Rob Jones, who is a set and costume designer in theatre and works all over the world, uh, theatre, musicals, opera, straight dramas, plays. And it was a great opportunity during the whole process of lockdown to grab him for, uh, I think it's, what was the running time, Jeremy? Approximately an hour? Just shy of an hour, yeah. Because he is notoriously one of the hardest men to get hold of and mostly responds to his messages at four o'clock in the morning. And I say that because I've worked with him and it was... An this is presumably because he compartmentalized his work so that, so, so that yeah, you were well, on the night shift. Well, they weren't, they weren't personal <laughs> responses at four o'clock in the morning. They were usually responses to messages that of work that, you know, process that took place during the day on the show that we worked together, which was mm-hmm. um, Fiddler on the Roof. I've known him as a designer for quite a few years and, and we, we don't, angels don't do that much work with him, but would there have been opportunities over the years and I remember sitting in a meeting because we were invited to bid to create the costumes for the Wizard of Oz Mm. that was on at the Palladium and it was an amazing experience to sit with him in the Lloyd Webber the 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 useful the rug offices that were at the time in Tower Street and just go through the precision and the the artistry of his designs the creations you know, and that's just the costume. He was also doing the set, so... I must imagine, after listening to your interview with him, having known him the length of time you have and where he is now when you worked with him, how long ago did you know him? Because it must have been a completely, which you'll hear from the interview, but a completely different work if it was maybe 10 years ago. The process he had uh, and, and he gets into with you is it evolved so much. So have you witnessed that yourself from knowing him and then working with him? Only seeing his work. I haven't... Okay. I haven't really had, because he's so prolific and he has done some amazing pieces of yeah, work. Four jobs at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's, that's you know, of course, nobody wants to be, that's not a perfect situation. It's it the problem with theatre and opera, and that doesn't necessarily affect people that work within film and television, is that, first of all, the remuneration is pretty bad. So you can't you can't just you can't live from one you job. can't create a career on just one job at a time unless every single job that you do has got um a huge success tag attached to it and there's residuals galore yeah but you know it's the, it's a different process and you historically and the way that the industry is structured is that you tend to do more than one job at a time but somebody that's as popular as rob who has unique relationships with directors. I mean, it was wonderful to see him working with Trevor Nunn, for example, because they have a, a, a shorthand. You know, I was the new boy in... in, in so the, there's, a, there's a code they use, is there? They yeah, use. yeah. And, yeah. And, it was, and it was remarkable because it meant that, that there was no wasting of time and mm-hmm. there were, it, every single point... And, it's, you know, it's not a straightforward process. You, you have a concept and you, you're working to design brief and a deadline and things come up things crop up through the process but the way that they were able to communicate uh in terms of props and staging and exits entrances and 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 how effortlessly and easily the process took place was 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 inspiring really Mm. inspiring for me one thing i noticed when i was looking at his his resume was that he's he's obviously down as the designer now in the case of fiddler of course he was the he was the set designer but you mm-hmm. were the costume designer yes yeah yeah so i i wonder how much of his work actually is is straddles both and how much of it actually is is just one or or the other in terms of costume or costume set or the set in terms of his credit. Mm. Yeah, well, because, I mean, if you take, for example, the one he talks about which he enjoyed the most, which was Taken at Midnight, he's down as the um, designer, um, mm-hmm. but doesn't say costume or theatre, but from the conversation, which you'll get to later, he obviously does the set. But 
I, I, I met, are we to make the assumption he did the costume too if there's no costume person in the credits? Yes. The yeah, that, that tends to be the rule, is Fine. that if, if set and costume is split between two designers, then they will be credited accordingly and you would refer to that work Mm. In, right. in, in in within within the creative uh, sphere in which you were operating. So your Olivier nomination, and let's get that back in there again, because I think. You know... <laughs> <laughs> let, let me just pick that. Let me pick that name up for you again, Richard. You just dropped it. You dropped it there. There's a there's a danger that we're all going to forget this. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> this my is, no. Your Olivier nomination for Fiddler was for the costume design. That's correct. It wasn't and a joint nomination with him for design. No, no, and and actually, it's 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 you know it's it's awkward because we, we are all designing the show, and mm. the fact that whoever is whoever deems to consider what is it's the word worthy is wrong, but whatever whatever is considered within the process of nomination yeah um is Worth any recognition is probably yeah is, yeah is anybody's game and a guess sorry yeah and um it's you know that's an awkward situation because we we as two practitioners were completely in sync from day one yeah you they collaborated on it but, yeah, but ultimately costume was down to you and and the staging and the set was down, down absolutely to yes mm-hmm. and he he fed off my ideas and I fed off his ideas. With, with two things with what you said, Jonathan. I mean, I suppose you're not the only one with the Olivia nomination in theory. With what you've said, that should maybe not feel uncomfortable, but it should be awkward because there is not the same production for the nominations this year for costume and set design. None of the production. Uh, that's a lie. And Juliet is the only one that is the designer and the set, the costume and set. But you're not the only one in that position well with Anne Juliet Sutra is is nominated for set and yeah. um, Paloma Young Paloma Young that's correct yeah, yeah. there is a slight um uh, audio issue halfway through the the interview you give and it's actually a really key point when he uses he says a phrase which is when he's talking about Taken at Midnight and how much he enjoyed it and the the, the set design and everything I would advise anyone who's listening to this and is interested in what what is said by rob about taken at midnight to actually go and look just google taken at midnight mark hayhurst and look at what the set looked like for such a single piece that he's done because the the set is lovely but the lighting as well the way it all plays off each other is incredible and i think after after listening to the interview and then looking at it i think you'll get a whole different understanding of the wording that he rob uses to describe his idea, number one, but just how powerful having that set actually is for that story. It it looks fantastic. We hope you've been enjoying these conversations. We've certainly been enjoying your feedback. If you have any questions or requests, please email them to podcast at angels.co.uk or you can visit our website, which is www.angelsbehindthescenes.com or you can find us on social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook forward slash costume podcast. And here's Jonathan's chat with Rob Jones. So I'm absolutely delighted that today we have the fantastic opportunity of hearing the pearls of wisdom of Mr. Robert Jones, designer par excellence in our wonderful world of costume and set, in primarily theatre and opera. Welcome, Rob. Hello, Jonathan. Lovely to talk to you. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled that you've agreed to join this podcast of ours because... I'm a huge fan of your work and I've got such an amazing amount of respect for the for the body of work that you've built up over the years and I just I feel that out of all of the designers that are working today and have got something to say about their process I've seen so much of what you've done over the years and I just think that you are brilliantly clear with the narrative and you you solve so many problems and present a world that is utterly believe, you know, utterly believable and, and draws you in. And, you know, I feel very honoured to have had the opportunity to work with you on Fiddler and when we, because I felt that the, 
our worlds complemented each other in such a fantastic way and and your set and the intricacies of it drove the narrative forward brilliantly and presented a fiddler that you know people hadn't seen before well thank you it was one of for me i think it's probably up there in my top 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 shows of all the time i've been working i mean it was so special i've been i've been working since 1981 i know actually no 1980 in theater and I've been so lucky to be consistently in work. I haven't stopped since the day I left Central. I've worked and worked and worked. And weirdly, you know, given the world that we're in at the moment, I've just had time to reminisce on that. And this is the first time in the whole of those 40 years that I haven't worked, which is quite an extraordinary feeling. I've been so blessed and so lucky. When you mentioned Fiddler, that's one of the shows that I've come back to because it was a very, very special time. And we worked, as you say, together beautifully and we had a lovely lovely time and you know and I have a long relationship with Trevor who I adore and for me it was Mm. the perfect production for the three of us to work on. From my point of view as an introduction to Trevor I I, I, and and to be immersed in in his world of theatricality was a joy beyond any possibility and in fact the call that came through from Babani I thought I thought might have been a little bit of a (laughs) was a wind up because I just I, I it took me a minute to, to get my head around what 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 was being asked of me and the circumstances and I I I just felt that because at that point it was just um I'd like to get you in to me, to meet with Trevor and then then I didn't I because I was in a state of shock I didn't then say and who else is on the team and then when I did get up the kind of sense to say who else who else is going to be with us and he mentioned you and I thought, Oh my goodness, this is this is just like everything is just sort of slotting into place in the most amazing way. Perfect. So um yeah. It was the it was it was it was the perfect setup. So I, I want to I want to that's kind of where where in a way where you're at, because I know that you you you're juggling so many jobs at once at one time in terms of what's happening at that point and then what's happening in the future and what you're preparing for Mm. but let me just jump right back to just before you actually sort of got got to central and if you could just give us some insight into what what was it that if you like your light bulb moment where you realized that the world of design especially in terms of the fact that you're the whole picture um was it architecture or was it the idea of the theatrical narrative or what 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 took you along that journey right at the very start i think one of the main thing as a child i mean i grew up in durham not the city of the county of and um every weekend my dad and my mum we bundle us into the car and we said right we're going on a day out and we would visit endless stately homes we'd go somewhere every weekend and we'd drive for you know a good two hours and end up in all these different amazing places so i was constantly surrounded by and interested in all these beautiful buildings and and as you rightly say the architecture and i didn't realize it at the time but i just absolutely loved architecture and then here comes the cliche i had a puppet theater um which my Mm. dad built for me we had a little old outbuilding at the bottom of the garden in the village where I grew up and um, he built me a theatre a proper proper theatre with a fly tower and scenery which he painted for me and I had all of those um, which people will know those Pelham puppets I had a whole collection of those and I used to play around and invent things design my own scenery and design clothes for the, the puppets and all of that anyway that was that and then cut to I decided to I wanted to go to art school uh, and I actually really didn't know what I wanted to do so I did the foundation course which I think is a brilliant thing to do and I think halfway through that I realized that I really I wanted to do theatre or architecture but theatre was an interesting thing and then I decided to go to apply for Central School of Art and Design as it was then but I still underlying all of that and it's still there in me now and it will never go away as my love of architecture. Mm. And I think I secretly always wanted to be an architect, but never really had the guts to do it. And I think I was sort of, I had a romantic notion of being an architect, which was, you know, period architecture. So I 
didn't really mm. want to go into the world of designing where I would have done at that time, being into sort of civic architecture and, you know, car parks, hospitals, civic buildings. And I realized that what it was, was a lot of history of architecture. So in a weird way, that's what being a designer became, because you can apply all of those elements and the rigor of being an architect, you know, mm. the proportion and you know, all of that, and still, you know, apply it to theater. Not as literally as that. But and telling a story. Yeah, telling a story. But, you know. but it's, a, it's a narrative. Absolutely. And was that something that, that I mean, it's, it sounds the way you're describing it, that it was quite self-motivated, but it, that apart from the support from your parents and family in terms mm. of, you know, hobbies. Yeah. But did you have that guidance from school? Were they, did they recognise that there was something that, you know, in, as opposed to, Get steering you towards mathematics and the sciences they were was there somebody there steering you to it i was terrible at maths mm. in fact really bad at maths and weirdly that's one of the things that we all use now is it's calculation you know i'm always working things out and measurements and a sense of proportion and, and scale but you know i was always i always drew and i had little sketchbooks and you know and i am an i was an i am an only child had a lot of time on my own where I would do those sort of things. So I had a very inventive mind. It was always sort of, you know, coming up with ideas and looking at things and how can I make this? I was talking about this very thing the other day. I had an old uh, multi-story car park model as a child, you know, you could sort of with ramps and store, and I turn it into a TV studio. It wasn't a car park. So everything <laughs> became something else. So I think I've always had that brain. I look at things and go, how can I make that into, how can we make this. I'm, I'm very sort of. I, I love the idea of your um, heightened reality, yeah. where you know something as mundane as a as a model car park. petrol station stroke car showroom yeah. becomes a, sto- a storytelling device, yeah, and I, I think that's I think that's very important and very noticeable about how you work with your directors to take the audience on that journey and working within the structure of whether it's the, the mediums of theatre or opera. And I, have you have you segued into film and television? Have you had that opportunity during, during your career? I did a production of Hamlet. When David Tennant was Hamlet for the RSC, which was about 10 years ago, we did it in Stratford and then it came to London. And then the BBC Two and a company called Illuminations decided to not film the stage production, but to reinvent it for tv so we took the stage production Mm. and we did a tv version so we didn't actually do it on stage at all we went and we we built sets we found a location and filmed it over about eight weeks so that's my only foray into that and i really actually rather enjoyed it because it it had the essence of the theater production and it had the same aesthetic you know, the same clothes, the same furniture, the same props, Mm. and the look of it, but spatially it was completely different. And I learned a lot from that. I made quite a lot of mistakes, you know, and when I've watched it back, I thought, wouldn't have done that, should have changed this, but, you know, I didn't know, but we just, we all had a go, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It's interesting that it's the the transfer of the medium from, from the stage into the environment of sets and builds and, and controlled locations s- still lends itself a, 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 a theatricality and it, it would be interesting to see what you would do with the challenge of taking taking it out into the into the external world in terms of a, a, a project like if it, so for example a hamlet that was you know if you like more cinematic in the sense of the traditional aspect of how you would process a film i'd love to see how you'd Mm-hmm. how you tackle that because I think it's I, th- I think that you would do very well I think that because of your theatrical background you have a linear structured way of approaching a project that most film people that kind of come through the ranks don't see the world in the same in that same way and I think there's always a, a very interesting artistic curve that kind of comes into play when somebody from a theatrical background crosses over and works in 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 that different medium 
I mean, and, and of course, it's, you know, I'm, I'm not yeah. suggesting that tomorrow you go out and you do a film because, you know, you're very comfortable and secure and, and excited about the world that you're currently you know, inhabiting. Yeah. I mean, I think that you touched on something before about storytelling and narrative, which links to the question you just asked. But the thing I enjoy about my work and collaborating with directors is I, I, I feel when we're designing productions and you ultimately, you know, for an audience, an auditorium, hopefully full of people, who are there to go along on the ride with you. Mm. For me, I think the audience needs to really understand where they are. And as soon as the audience understand the world they're in, they feel comfortable. Mm. They then sort of almost lean in to watch mm. and they're not worried. If the audience spends the first 15 to 20 minutes thinking, where am I? I don't quite understand this. Uh, who's that person? What's that? You've lost them. Mm. And they don't listen to what anyone's saying. And it can be as clear as you like on stage the actors could be in complete clarity in telling the story but the audience aren't actually listening because they, they're trying to work out where they are and i think that's one of the things i most enjoy about our world is saying to an audience come with us this is the world we're in we're going to take you on this journey and this is the story we're going to tell and they they will be with you every second of the way and to that end you can do a completely empty stage but if the floor is right and a piece of furniture and a light fitting, the clothes vital and a few props, they will fill in all of those gaps. Mm. And I know we mentioned Fiddler before, but that's sort of what we tried to do on that. Mm. You know, we didn't do 59 scene changes with endless bits of furniture. We really did it with hardly anything, but the audience knew exactly where they were. Mm. And I, I like detail and I like spectacle, but at the same time, I like that focus of where to look which interestingly is quite filmic because in 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 movies the the camera does all of that work for the audience and i think you know when we're directing and designing that's what we've got to do for the audience is telling them where to look rather than their eye wandering around yeah. and not concentrating so yeah. it's, there are similar things there oh there's there's no question that it's about drawing an audience into the world that you're creating but i I think that the the theatrical experience is so much more visceral. And as you say, when you get it right, to send out an audience in a state of excitement as a result of what they've just experienced and gone through mm. is perhaps one of the most unique experiences. It's vital. And I, I hope you know you'd agree with this that it it's it's all about the storytelling and how important the the script is that enables you as a as an artist to to do your best work i think we sort of touched on it a couple of days ago actually in terms of how you will you you're there you know in your capacity as the designer with the director to solve all of the problems of the show and to to keep the narrative yeah. driving forward and how how important would you say then is the script in that instance it's vital i mean it's not a light suggestion i mean it is the story the text you know and it is we've got to constantly refer to it because those are the words that are coming out of those performers mouths you know and you've got to it, the two have got to connect completely and again i think you know i always see it as my role and and i've sort of fallen into this quite a lot a lot of people will say well let's get rob to do this because it, it's the fluidity you know, and I think there's a lot of writing now when I've read, you know, a lot of new writing, some brilliant new writing, whereas there are a lot of sort of problems to solve, you know, because it's more often than not, things are multi-locational now. You know, you're on a bus, you're in a cafe, you're in a bar, you're in a bedroom, you're in a living mm. room, you're in a kitchen, and it's snap, 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 snap. Now, sometimes those, those pieces are written literally where there's a reference to someone turning on a tap or turning on the TV or whatever. Sometimes it's just this script actually doesn't refer to the location that the actor might be in. So they could be saying the same words in the living room as they were in the kitchen or the bedroom. Mm. So in some you know, new writing pieces, which I've done quite a lot, I will read it and I will say to the director, but actually, do we need that two-minute scene in the kitchen? Mm. 
or the three minute scene in the bedroom, mm. would the scene still work if they were saying the same lines in one location rather than just changing locations four times within 10 minutes? Because I think that breaks the flow. And, and one of my you know big things which I love doing is actually keeping the piece moving. And I really enjoy solving a problem of a scene change so that it's seamless. Yeah. And for me, the moment the set is changing is equally important as a scene that's come before and is about to follow. So that if the audience is sort of switching off for, let's hope, no more than 30 seconds for a big scene change, you don't want to lose them. You want to keep them interested. So whatever's happening needs to be interesting to look at as about what is interesting to, that's about to be listened to. Of course, to. and that's a science. I, I remember doing a, a big new production of the sound of music at the palladium which for me was beyond exciting it was just a wonderful wonderful thing to do it was in 2006 andrew lloyd webber it's one of his favorite shows he wanted to do a brand new version of sound of music jeremy sam's directed he and i had worked together on many many things with great chums and colleagues anyway we started work on this and when we began working on it we were one of the big things was solving all the scene changes. So there's a there's a moment when Maria decides to leave the Abbey and she, well, not decides, she, she's leaving the Abbey and she's been sent off to be the governess with the captain and the children. And we decided to stage the moment from her leaving the Abbey to arriving in the hallway of the empty house of, the, of Captain Von Trapp. So we did it and we made the whole journey, the whole scene change happen. We watched her literally pick up her guitar, her bag, open the door, walk out, walk along the road. Because there's a song there's a song through that journey, isn't there? I have confidence. Yeah, I, I have confidence in everything. Which was in the film, but not in the original musical. Ah. Um, oh. I believe. And maybe shot down in flames, but I think that's correct. And she, so we saw her walking along the road saying, I have confidence. The gates of the house arrived. She walked through the gates. She saw the outside of the house. She walked into the house. And this was all timed exactly to the beat of the song. And so that we did about five scene changes during the song. And the audience absolutely loved it. Cut to when we'd eventually got the whole show up and running and we'd been previewing and we worked it all through. Uh, Ted Chapin, who runs the Rodgers and Hammerstein estate, said cut 22 minutes from the show by doing scene changes that segue from one to the other which we didn't realize because if you look in the original the, the very first broadway production it is written as a set a front cloth a moment in front of a front cloth the set changes behind it then another front cloth Whereas we didn't stop, we just we made every moment part of the production mm. and that for me that that's a really important thing and i and i'm really proud of what we did on on that show you know in order to and that again is your thing about narrative storytelling keeping it moving you know getting from a to b without the audience feeling it. did they allow that cut that that amount of time to be cut from the show were they happy that you you'd solved a life problem yeah we hadn't actually cut the piece we just speeded it up by not waiting for scene changes because we'd included them under music and songs and and so it all happened so we'd sort of edited the show without actually chopping it around we'd sort of just brought it all together and um i loved it i think so many of our audience that that would be listening to this podcast and general audience that that aren't necessarily aware of the complexities of how these of how this process takes place would be so intrigued by that because you know again you there's an expectation that that an audience either likes or hates what it is that they're watching, and it doesn't matter whether it's TV, film, cinema, whatever. But it's a psychological process as well as as well as a physical process that the audience has to go through. And and the way that you've just described the last kind of examples of of, of that process does make you realise what what a science, what alchemy goes into all of these situations and you know you've got something like as you just described the sounds of music which is if you like tried tested classic you know this is the formula this is the way it is you know you'd think okay well you know there you go you just sort of put that on and mount it and yes how marvelous the palladium the scale okay. the size the cast yeah. and and the association with with Lloyd Webber and then 
you've got a new piece which has never been done before and you know you've got a different set of of dynamics that need to be processed and i think that that's what makes this world so intriguing and keeps us going it absolutely does i mean i i had last year i did a new musical called the boy in the dress which was based on a david walliams novel and david's novel was adapted by mark ravenhill to a stage piece and the music was written by robbie williams and guy chambers directed by greg doran at the rsc um and we worked on that for three years as a team where we would say like i said before you know there would be moments where i would say to mark look we're in the school playground and we're about to jump in a car to drive to the football field to watch a football match. And then we're back in uh, Dennis, the little boy who wears a dress in his family kitchen. And then we're in his bedroom. Do we need to do all of that? Could this just, you know, could we leave the playground and could there be in a sort of nowhere streetscape to have the conversation that you've just had rather than we change the set four times. Otherwise, I think in the initial draft, we worked out there was something like 95 scene changes or something. It was like cut to, cut to, cut to, cut to, which when you read it is fine. But when it's physically happening on the stage, you're actually adding a third onto the evening by the amount of scene changes that you've got to have with the location. And we worked through that over the years and we got it down and we made again, and I worked with a choreographer on that, Alita Collins, brilliantly, where we just moved the set with the actors to the music during a song, by the end of a song, bang, we were into the next location, lights up. And we weren't really aware of the scene change because it was all included in what was going on. And But we still knew where we were in the next stage of the story. I think that mm. for me is, bec- it's not something I set out to do. It's just something that happened in that I've always been a problem solver and I like to work out how things fit and where they move to. Um, and I think it's just become part of my aesthetic. Do you, do you think that's something that triggered in you quite early in your career? Was it? Did you learn that from the designers that you assisted Stroke Associated for once you'd left, once you graduated? Was that was that was that the world that you immersed? absolutely? I mean, I was so lucky that I was in that period at Central when it was run by, you know, John Gunter, Ralph Coltine, Maria Bjornsson, Pamela Howard, Philip Prowse, Bill Dudley, I mean, Mm. all hugely successful working designers who we would all go and see their work and they would say, oh, look, are you not doing anything this weekend? Come and do a bit of model making. Would you do a bit of drawing for us? So I sort of began that assistant world while I was a student which I thought was fascinating because you know I was learning but doing it and watching it and going off to the national or the RSC to or the West End to see the product that I'd worked on with these people and and then I I didn't actually do the assistant route immediately after leaving Central I on my sort of graduation year Ralph Coltai offered me uh, a year of assisting him and which I accepted uh, to go and work on a production of Hamlet in Sweden, I think it was. I can't quite remember. But at that time, the, there's a, there was um, a scheme, which is the Lindbury Prize is the equivalent now. At that time, it was called the Arts Council Designers Bursary, where the Arts Council awarded two bursaries a year to graduating theatre design students. And you were given the opportunity to go and work in a professional theatre for one year as the Arts Council assistant trainee. And you would be given one production of your own Mm. to design. I was lucky enough to win that in that year. And I went to Oldham Coliseum. So I said to Ralph, I've been offered this. And he said, do it. You'll learn far more by being at the coalface by actually doing that than you will with me because you'll you'll have to solve your own problems and you'll be there. So I literally did that and went up to Oldham yeah. and I painted the sets. I worked in the workshop. I built props. Uh, I built models for the in-house designer who was a wonderful um, designer called Caroline McCulloch, who sadly is no longer with us. But And I worked there and I was given my very first show of my own to design, which was an Alan Bleasdale play. But at the same time, I had to paint that set myself and help 
make the props and things for it. So I was right from the start, from leaving, I was hands on. Was that the condition of you taking, being given that job? Was that you can you can have this yeah Leesdale project here on the understanding that you will be doing this this this. It and was this. just what everyone did. It was it was an old rep system, you know, where everyone who worked in that building worked on the shows that came out of the other end, you know. So it, there was a sort of weird right. discipline. If I couldn't paint it, I couldn't design it because it was me who had to paint it. Not me on my own. There were, you know, there were three of us there. But at the same time, it was just, I became a very practical person, but I just learned so much. And then from there, yeah. I, I, I was offered to stay on for another year as the associate designer in the building. The director at that time was a, 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 a director called Kenneth Allen Taylor, who was just so a champion of mine and then he he went to nottingham playhouse and took over nottingham and then he invited me to go and work at nottingham so i was just very lucky that i began as an assistant but actually then just started designing in my own right and one job led to the other and one job you know and i just met so many people like we all do along the way and then all those connections added up as we build up our world you can say you could say luck but actually rod it's it's clear that the the focus and the passion that you that you have for every stage of the process has put you in countless situations where people want you on board. You know, it's it's. I, I always think of the the job of designing as as being, if you like, fifty five percent designing, but but the balance is actually the psychology of designing, and and how you are within a room and and at all the stages, and that means being able to function with collaborators in terms of directors and producers and lighting and then your own teams you know whether it's your your supervisors with costume and your prop builders and set decorators and i think that you know all of all it is all about the learning and it's all about making the right choices at the right time have you have you ever felt that you've You've, you've got yourself involved with a job where all of that we've just been talking about has not been solvable. And you've, you've kind of gone through the process as fast as you can in order to come out the other way and move on. Has, has that ever happened to you? Or has every job that you've, without, without you don't have to give the details, <laughs> yeah. but I just, I'm just interested to know whether you've got that sort of comparison in, in your life that you can you know what the best yeah. is and you also know what the worst is and you can see where those points through the process are that can kind of guide you <laughs> in terms of how it's going to turn no, out. I know exactly what you mean but just briefly where you started this was um, when I was at Central John Gunter said to me being a designer is 25% design and 75% applied psychology weirdly. Oh, sorry. So I'm I'm crediting designers the the percentage is too yeah, high. You know. <laughs> but that I that stuck with me and I and I do go into and I think about it all the time because we I do think we're sort of problem solvers and firefighters a lot of the time and we have to deal with situations and I've seen you do it you know that we have to sort of talk people down and we have to then provide a route through and I I do feel as designers when we go into a project it's it's vital that we sort of come on we're all going to jump off this cliff together or we're not but i feel that mm. when i deliver designs for a production i've got to make everyone feel included and i've got to excite everyone and get them on board because we're all mm -hmm. doing it together and you know and i do get very involved i'm not a sort of hand it over, get on with it person. Probably too involved sometimes, I would say. How do you solve that then when you're when you are so busy? What what is what what is somebody getting of you when you're you know and that's also a, a common practice within the, the especially within the world of theatre and opera where the 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 idea that you are, if you like, multitasking between jobs yeah not just in terms of the functions that one has within the actual job itself, but within other jobs. Mm -hmm. How how do you kind of like shut the door on one and open it on another within perhaps even hours? Is it is that a, a huge psychological 
strain on it you? Or do, no, or... it absolutely is. I mean, there are times, and I, I, will, I will say it myself, that I've taken on too many jobs. And sometimes, and I'm sure you've been in a similar position, we take on jobs, but the world we work in, it shifts. You know, so I will sometimes mm. accept a job mm. which is overlapping because we have to. You know, we're not, we don't have that luxury of working on one project at a time. Whereas I will be maybe, I've got four jobs all overlapping. And even when I would only ever, and even that's tricky, is have two shows in rehearsal at the same time. And that is, can be quite dangerous. I think there could be a, there could be a sort of final couple of week overlap, but literally side by side is, is dangerous. That has happened to me sometimes when the dates have shifted and you have to honour both of those commitments. So you're sort of stuck between the two and you have this terrible divided loyalty of feeling guilty about, I should be here, I should be there. Oh no, I should be here. And, and, and you've just got to sort of calm down. But what I try to do, if I've got, say, two projects being designed in the studio and two, one show in rehearsal and another one about to overlap towards the end of a, a rehearsal period, is I really try and compartmentalize. So I will do the morning on one and then I will do the afternoon on, the, on another. And I will really try not to take any phone calls or answer any questions about the morning one while I'm doing the afternoon one. To, so I can give each of those mm. the importance. Because if you try and sort of do both at the same time, I think people feel shortchanged. And of course, it's about the transparency of it mm. as well. You, there's, there's no point in... You know, it's an acknowledged fact, as I as I said previously, that that, that that there are so many factors in terms of process and overlapping and you know scheduling and, and and issues like that, and also you know circumstances, especially when you're working on something like the, the boy in the dress with that's a devised piece. Yes. And ha, is that is that a very structured process in terms of you you, you know you you being approached to. I, I presume it's not just it's not about an availability check it's about whether you would be interested in coming on board yeah you know with everybody else right from the start we knew there was a, a an opening date of november 2019 and mm -hmm. over that three-year period there were four workshops between two and three weeks each and it was committing to those i couldn't commit to every single day but I did most of it because I was doing other shows and I was in tech for something and I was in Madrid at one point during all of that. So, but there was a commitment to which we would all be together and we would get a bunch of actors in the room. We would try things out. I mean, that was all about how do you play football on stage? The initial thing, the practicalities of yeah, it. Yeah. And then we started to do all the work on, um, you know, the script and, then how what the design how the design works and Mark Ravenhill was brilliant. He will say, "Well, actually, what would you rather that location was? Well, let's swap it around, you know." And I said, "Well, I can't really deliver that immediately after that scene because it's a huge technical thing." And I know you've written a house that's got yeah. the kitchen, them sliding down the stairs, being in a bedroom, then in a, a living room, and then a, then the house is moving around. Does it really need that? Can we do it much more minimally? Well, yes, of course we can. Now I've seen what we can do in the rehearsal room. And then he would adapt the script. And that's a joy, you know, because you really feel you're creating something from scratch uh, rather than reacting. And I think, is that, is that something that one builds up to in one's career? As, you know, going back to what you were saying about where, being at mm. Oldham and kind of and having these these kind of these amazing mentors when that point came, presumably, what, what was the first after Nottingham? Then, what what we what did you do? What was your what was your next stage? Do you remember? Well, when I was at Nottingham, I I did a production of it was Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, which is a famous Nottingham movie, which we did a stage adaptation. Yeah, and in it was yeah. a, a an actor called Trisha Kelly, and her sister Jude Kelly came to see the play, and she said to me. I really like your work. Can we have a chat? And we did. And she said, oh, I'm about to open this new theatre in Leeds called the West Yorkshire Playhouse. I'd like you to come and open the building with me. And I did. And I went there for a year and I designed seven product. I did the opening production and was very involved in the opening of the building. I did the opening production. Then I designed, I think it was seven production in, in the two different spaces. Wow. A year, 18 months. And worked with her. And then... 
I did that and I was while I was doing that I was doing the odd sort of bit of freelance work and that was my sort of last building based job even though I wasn't sort of there all the time I was very much tied to the building and then from then on just sort of did lots of you know freelance work and it just built and built and built and then met so many different directors and then you know one show would lead to the next and on it went of course and sort of a part of that whole story about 15 16 years ago um uh an opera director who i admired hugely called david mcvicker yeah. just got in touch with me one day and said i think i'd like to talk to you about working in opera and he lives at that time in islington around the corner from us he, he's now since moved but so he said, come round to the house. So I went round to his house and he said, I've been looking at your work for a while in theatre and I really feel you should make a bit of a leap into opera. So why don't you come do that with me? So I literally went to do an opera, the Champs-Élysées in Paris with him, then to Glyndebourne. And then I've worked with him at the Met five times. I've been in Australia, Tokyo, Vienna. I've worked all over the world with him for the last 15 years, maybe doing you know, one or two operas a year, who gave me a completely different lifestyle in in the theatre world. And, and just working with him has been a fantastic opportunity. I just think that working on those massive pieces then fed back into my theatre work hugely. And it's sort of one feeds the other. Yeah. Uh, and what I've really enjoyed is having, doing the massive work on, on that scale with him has given me it, it makes the sort of theatre work even braver and more daring because you think oh I can bring this and it's just sort of, it gives you a, a sort of renewed confidence it's been really interesting how one feeds the other and likewise theatre back in the opera, so. is that a retrospective idea of your in terms of in terms of how it upped your game, did you were you aware of it at that point that going through that process of transitioning no, no, no. opera to theatre? So then, so reflecting back, you you realise that the opportunities that were given to you by, I mean, obviously, first of all, being able to work all over the world in the most amazing environments, and then amazing, yeah, and then feeding that. I mean, that's that's you know that is that's a unique opportunity, and it's it's incredibly special. What, how did that mean then that if you were preparing and planning for perhaps something that was at the Met or um, as far away as Australia, what, did, did, did that preparation work take place in the UK and then you would, you know, you would go off to those destinations in order to go through the process? Yeah, I mean, I, it, it all takes place here, you know, so everything's designed here and then it, you literally send it off in a little box, well, not a li little box, a big box. Mm. Off it goes, you know, it it flies across the world and you follow it. And then you arrive there and, you know, it's exactly the same process as it is in theatre, but you're just dealing with, you know, a whole different bunch of people. Yeah. You know, I, I've I worked with a lot of regulars here. But but even now, having said that, you know, having worked at the Met as much as I have, I know all the, the crew and the workshops and the costume department and the props, you know, really well now. They know me, I know them, and we 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 literally get a shorthand together. And I, I'm 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 doing another one in twenty two for them, so we've been talking about that recently. Uh, and it'll be sort of nice to you know see the same people. Yeah, let's let let's hope they're all there. <laughs> yeah, that, that, well, that's the problem. I don't know if they will be, but there was a I think it was about four years ago I was doing a play which was a, a really really interesting new piece, and it was again multi it was based on a documentary uh, so in its very nature was very episodic and multi-locational and was originally written as a tv script and then decided to be put on in theater and when i read the script i said to the director it still feels like a documentary and it still feels very chopped up and it's such a strong story it was a very very powerful it was set in in Germany um, and it, it 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 was so powerful and fascinating that it just felt the whole evening was being chopped into little segments and it was losing its impact and I said to him can we do a big a big idea 
you know, let's do a set that doesn't change. Let's just make it one world that everything happens within this one space. Mm. And sort of silence of a of a director looking slightly nervous. And then I said, am I being too operatic? And I remember those words now. And I think that the words operatic can be overused. It's like, you know, designery or theatrical or whatever. Mm. We've got to be mm. careful how we use them. And I said, am I being too operatic? And he said, well, if you mean like one big, conceptual idea then no i don't think you are i think it's entirely appropriate mm. and i probably wouldn't have had that thought or that idea or pushed that had i not been doing that that other work mm. and we went for it and we did it and it was one of the best things i've ever done it's up there in one of my you know top shows what was it it's a play called midnight which began in chichester in the minerva and then we did it at the haymarket theater penelope wilton was in it and she won an olivier that year and it was it was wonderful and we just we sort of did something very big and bold with it and the play was so strong it could take it yeah had it had i'd not felt the play was strong enough i wouldn't have done that because i think it it sort of swamps things sometimes but it it actually made it really really powerful even more powerful i should say when these ideas come to you the thought process that goes towards a concept is that is that something that do you sit down in a in a you know for, for want of a better word a, a dark room and kind of work it all out or or is that does that take you time is that something that you know you'll be you'll be kind of chopping an onion and it would be like do you know what i think that we can do, is yeah, it yeah, is it that fluid right. it, is that. It, it depends some things take longer than others some things ideas come quite quickly and i think i've got out of this habit now but i always remember as a design student it, it was sort of instilled into us like you know keep having the ideas have the ideas have the ideas and i think you know we there would be i would probably do 10 different designs for one production mm. before i decide which one i was going to do now sometimes the first idea will be what ends up on stage and it's having the sort of confidence to think no, that is the right idea. Mm. For years and years and years, I would think, no, 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 I can't do the first idea because there's going to be a better one along the way. There's going to be another one. Let's let's, let's park that. Let's mm. keep thinking. Let's keep thinking. And I soon learned that I would keep coming back to the first idea. And you think, well, actually, why waste the time if that is a gut reaction? And that's what it is all about. It does all. It's all instinctive. Yes. Then why not? You know, you clearly thought that was. It popped into your brain. It fits. You work that logic through the piece. You apply that idea. Does it work for everything? Pretty much, yes. Right, let's do it. And quite often, you know, sometimes, you, as you say, chopping an onion or whatever you're doing, you go, bing, that's that little idea, tick. Mm. And now, even now, in this sort of time when we're not really working, I've got things that we might be doing and are supposed to be happening, but nobody knows when. I've still mm. got all the, I've got a sketchbook for a show, and I just keep, you know, tickling an idea and when I have it. And there are things that I know that hopefully will happen. I've got those ideas now. And some of them, those are the first ideas. That's amazing because I think that so many people kind of go into like an, in, if they're not physically actively working on, on any myriad of things at one time, they go into a period of inertia and you end up becoming, mm -hmm. you end up becoming a bit stuck. And, and it's like ideas, ideas become ideas so you're you feed in to your own ideas as you're progressing and processing everything else and um it's yeah. like it's it's that old uh, i'll probably get this wrong this expression but um it, to do with being busy busy keeps you busy and being busy keeps you busy oh yeah if you want something done ask a busy person is that the thing yes that's the one that's the one and, it, and it's because you you're you're working within such a tight discipline within yourself that it it feeds up other ideas and i, I wondered going just jumping back a, a little bit again as the recipient of a of a bursary of an award hmm. does did that initially give you the confidence to be able to go into an environment a meeting environment or an organization with with, with a certain attitude that that you were coming into the room having been acknowledged as somebody who had achieved that at that particular point or did it did it just did it not make any difference to you do you know i never actually thought about it until you asked the question but 
I suppose it did, yeah. It's a bit of a tick, isn't it? It's a little pat, you know. Well done. Yeah. So yes, I suppose it did. Yeah. And I think that's a lot to do with the um the, the panels of judges that are on these associations, whether it's mm-hmm. Limbury or you know, as was Motley and 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 in fact, you know, as you say, the art the Arts Council, when when you are being acknowledged by your I suppose mm. superiors in that in that way, you feel that your it, it must give you a confidence in order to be able to, and I and and I don't I don't suggest for a second that you know, emperor's new clothes or anything like that because because I think that the money is so tight in in the sense of the availability of it mm. that when when an award is given along with an amount of money in order to I suppose protect the practitioners that they can they can advance their practice it's it's given in a way that you're right every 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 box has to be ticked and I think it's a very you know for anybody out there that's sort of contemplating the next stage I think if if the availability and the opportunity to submit work to a panel that that can then take you on to the next stage. It should never be overlooked. No, I mean, it was, I mean, in hindsight, it was an amazing sort of security blanket. You know, I I sort of, you know, I did my foundation course. I went to Central, did the, the degree course. At the end of that, look at this, tick, you know, Pat, you've been, you've won this. Yeah. And then went on to do that where I was supported. I was paid a, you know, tiny salary, but I was working con- constantly and I, I had money in the bank albeit not very much, but, you know, it was there and I rented a little flat. And then I'm just remembering as I'm talking to you, um, I then would sort of, when I stayed on and did the second bit, you know, what someone said to me, would you like to do this little job? And I would do the odd freelance job to supplement what I was doing. But I was only sort of topping up that security, which I was given, which is an extraordinary gift, you know. And that does not happen now, you know. I mean, people graduating and going to the outside world have to knock on the doors and majority of people assist and I still think that's a really vital thing to do uh in to go and work alongside another designer and you know if it's a larger studio a designer might have two or three assistants in there you know there's a really good atmosphere and everyone's working and then quite often and I've done it myself you know if you you you're working and you have a, an assistant you've worked with a long time and you really value them someone will say i'm looking for a young designer to do this production you recommend and that's how it happened i think Mm. a really really important route and i think you know we've all got to support that tell me when in terms of your teams and your collaborators Mm. when would you not take a project if you felt that your studio and your closest collaborators weren't available to do that project with you or would you explore other avenues what I mean given that given that everything that is put in front of you to work on is something that you would want to do is there a point where you would withdraw because you didn't feel that you would have the right manpower to be able to realize exactly what it was that you wanted to do probably I mean I've been lucky enough to work with some really really good people obviously those people then move on and move up and do their own thing but you know, there's always someone new along along the way. But I mean, I do tend to work with a very sort of small group of people who I really value because they bring so much to the design. And I think yeah. designers, we don't be telling porky pies if we said, "Oh yeah, that's all my idea." It's not. It's never all a designer's idea because you know this. You know, when you're working with a costume supervisor. That you know the best designers are only the best designers because they have the best supervisors working with them. You know, someone will say, "Actually, no, that colour's wrong. That fabric's wrong. No, why don't we do this?" Or, you know, that shape's not very good. And having those extra eyes, you know, or a or a, a, an assistant or associate designer who is working with you in the studio, drawing up the set and making the model, they will go, "No, I think this should be like this," and they will change it. And they're often right. So it's it's never, ju- I mean, it is the designer's vision, but at the same time, the way it all comes together, it's a group of people who feel they can have a voice. I mean, I've worked with people who've never said a word yeah, or would yeah. never question anything. 
and I'm much happier when people say, actually, no, that's not right. Why don't we do this? I think this will be better. And I enjoy that. You know, I really enjoy that sort of collaboration. I, when we work together, you come to me and say, what about that bit of fabric? What do you think of this? Should we do this? Or, you know, I'd ask you a question. And I think that's great. And ultimately, yes. it's all one world, you know, one big picture. I think it's beholden on on that person who is asking the questions or or bringing something into the conversation to think about what what that question is and what they're going to say mm. before they say it, because the, yes. the, the the process is so fraught with the, the psychological dynamic. And however, one always has to examine oneself and think about the effect that you have as an individual within a room, within an environment. And, you know, none of us are, can see into the future and we don't have crystal balls. So we don't know what's coming around the corner. And, and I think that from the amount of experience that I've gathered as a, as, you know, as a, as a, as a, if you like, as a freelance costume designer, as opposed to my the hat that I wear at Angels as, as a production director. Mm. And, and I've watched people's process, um, including yours, you know, over the years. And I've seen how, I've seen mm. how they work. And I, I, I hear, you know, I, I also have people at the Met that I know, not, not because I've designed there, but because I've supplied costume to them, you know, through Angels. And, you know, mm. and, and people's, people's conversations about people's process is, ever is always intriguing for someone like me because I'm obsessed with process. I, lo I love it. I think that the, you know, to, to, to get to the end, to get to the end point is so much more enjoyable than the end point. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, at the end I'm thinking, okay, well, what's next? I'm not, I'm not able to sort of just look at the end and kind of relax within that and, and, and get closure. I'm always trying to, you know, I'm always, I'm, I, I always want the next experience. It's a, you know, in that respect, I'm a bit of a junkie for process. But I, and I, and I, <laughs> and I get the sense that what you get out of the, all of the jobs that you do and the people that you work with is having that sense of relationship and, and oh, contact. So important. Yeah. And then not just with, not just and with your fun. own immediately oh. your major team, but with performers, you know, I, I remember sitting. Uh, yeah. I remember sitting at a birthday lunch last. It was either no, it was the year before last. And um, Penelope Wilton was 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 also a guest at this lunch, and she was she happened to be sitting opposite me, and she we were chatting about the world, and she was about to step into the menu to do. Um, I've actually forgotten the title of the piece, but the David Hare play. Yeah, the David Hare play. Bay, the Bay at Nice, I think. The Bay at Nice. That's right. It was. I was going to say Naples, but it's Nice. Mm -hmm. And um, she said, uh, she asked what I was working on, and I, I told her that we'd just finished Fiddler, and she went, "Oh, I love Rob. I love him with a passion. <laughs> Most <laughs> intelligent, articulate, caring. It was like it was." My 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 head was swelling for yeah. you. It was it was, a, and I and I and it also yeah. made me realize that you know it, it's, it goes both ways. I mean, well, because it's about I love her to pieces. It's about having relationships and trust of your performers, and and that also drives it drives you it drives your job forward. And I, mm -hmm. I think that's that's what makes our world so so special. It does. It really does. It's been great and fun chatting about everything, and I'm going to draw it to a close and i'd just like to ask you one last question have you have you got a single piece of advice for somebody wanting to come into the business i think the thing i've learned about it is that i suppose and i i learned this quite late on is that i had a i had a passion for it but i never knew it was a passion i just thought it was something i was interested in and actually the more I did it, I realized it's an absolute passion and it's a care. And I think you've just, you've got to give everything to it. I know that's an obvious thing to say, but, and it will give back. It really will. It's, it's probably one of the poorest industries you'll ever work in, but it's probably, it can be one of the kindest. And I think the big thing for me is to go into it and try and enjoy it and have fun along the way as well. I mean, I take my job very, very seriously, but by God, I have a lot of fun while I'm doing it. And I think it's that balance. Mm. 
I think you've just got to enjoy, <clears throat> excuse me, you've just really, really got to enjoy it. I would agree with that. And I think that in terms of your, the, the way that you're able to balance, the, if you like, the split disciplines, you know, set, costume, mm. and, and then the perspective that you would then have on lighting and how that all comes together in the world of theatre, opera, dance, this, the whole medium, I think, is exemplified in the terms of the, the kind of work that you do. And, and again, it's as, as, you know, I'm asking you for what your piece of advice would be to somebody. It's, it's, not, it's not necessarily about the scale of the environment. It's about, it's about the environment itself that you are that you're that you're starting your story with yeah big or small the disciplines are exactly the same mm -hmm. and your responsibility is the same you know it could be in a one it could be one room mm. or it could be a three thousand mm. seat theater auditorium it's still the same you're doing the same job wherever you do mm. and mm. that will never change one fun thing i've always said is that sometimes at the end of a day i come home and i say i feel like someone's put a tap on the side of my head and it's been turned on all day and the water's been gushing out of it but there's been nothing going back in and you must feel the same <laughs> with constant answering questions coming up with solutions you know sometimes you think no or my, one of my things is i quite often say to people when they ask a question do you know what my ideas drawers are empty today i'm sorry come back when they're filled up again you know because it happens you've got to keep filling them up because they empty daily as, and as you're saying that you're, you're you're facing the camera and you've got the the, the round window behind you the square window yeah. the rectangular window absolutely the triangle window yeah. and what window are we going to go through today yeah. you tell me thank you rob so that was jonathan's chat with rob jones i think it's a great interview jonathan and the thing that i noticed as well looking into rob and his work after well, while i was listening to the interview is it's not just directors he keeps working with lighting directors there's the same lighting directors he's worked on between like eight or nine productions same choreographers he really has got these relationships in shorthand clearly with lots of different oh, yeah. departments yeah yeah and he's and he's really really respected and, ad and admired by um, producers and his own his own team you know his prop buyers his assistants I mean, I, I would, if Rob called and said, look, I'm, I'm having to split a job because, 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 I would literally drop everything to work with him again. Some of the comments he makes are lovely, and I really like the, the thought of tickling out an idea. Tickling out an idea, the tap on the head and the uh, mm. ideas draw being empty, I thought was, was, was oh. absolutely superb. So, and, and I forgot the percentages now, but so much design and so much applied psychology. Yes. <laughs> Which I, yes. was great. I think in yeah. one of my intro pieces, I, I make a comment about, you know, every everybody has got a fantastic eye and everybody is an artist and everybody has the capability of creating the work in in an artistic sense, but to actually... No, no, forget that. No, no, I don't think you should. I, I think I think it's an interesting idea you're teasing out. I'm not actually sure that everybody can. I can't. I can't. Anybody within the profession is capable of designing a production. But, but getting it, getting it to the stage, not, and yeah. going through the process in the way that Rob mentions is such an important part of the whole yeah. process. Yeah. And again, we know we know people that are fairly lazy with these things, and people that will sort of you know a, a doctor it'll do policy and of course they're not the people who win who win awards mm -hmm. and another person who likes to go on their gut now um so uh mm. which is well, that was also really interesting to hear how his process has evolved so it's uh, instinctive it really, what yeah, i didn't it realize about him was that he was instrumental in in the beginnings of the west yorkshire playhouse which is uh, yeah which was, became a powerhouse yeah yeah and quite an important part of our of our sort of costume history jonathan yeah yeah, yeah. Another goal for Jonathan, another designer we've not met, and another designer we've thoroughly enjoyed, Richard. Yes, so, yes. I'll, I'll bring him in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no pressure for the next interview you present to us, then. <laughs> next interview we're going to be having is my conversation with my brother, Daniel Angel. Yes, or as we like to call it, part three. Part <laughs> three, yes. Uh, uh, we have attempted to interview Daniel several times, unfortunately, technical difficulties. Um, so it's just we very elusive. Well, no, it, 
in fairness, the first one we, we the first first one we ever ever did was was Daniel. mine to Daniel, wasn't it? And we were sort yeah. of, you know, he hadn't got a microphone. I'm not sure I had a microphone actually, but um, yeah, and the sound was just complete rubbish, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, and it, I felt I felt really bad. Look, it was it didn't sound coming. rubbish. The sound, it, sound rubbish. Rubbish. it was. It, unfortunately, the audio quality was bad because mm. uh, it was us cutting our teeth for a podcast. But we threw a curveball by removing Richard from the scene so Daniel wouldn't feel it was the same questions from the same person. And yeah, because I did a second one, which also yeah. didn't go particularly well. No, so. he got stuck with his younger brother. No, it's um. It's a lovely interview. Daniel runs the costume department. He's also a director at Angels as well. And he's been here many years and he's responsible for our warehouse. Yeah. And it's it's a really enjoyable chat. Daniel started from the ground up uh, as a junior and worked where he is today. And that's no easy feat with your surname being Angel. And um, it was lovely to talk to him about it all. Here is a small excerpt from my conversation with Daniel Angel. When I came to the realisation that I could either go to university or come into the office, it was very hard for me to try and decide what I wanted to do because I could have learned it all from university and from books and things like that. Or I could have come in and learnt it uh, with my own two hands. And I just felt that part was me. I wanted to go and do, I wanted to be able to touch everything and be able to know what those items were to actually create a character. So for me, going into to, into Angels was a no-brainer. I really, really loved it, and that's what I did, and started from the bottom up. 